So today we're going to talk about the origins of natural selection, or basically how the idea of natural selection being a mechanism of, of evolution came to be. One of the other ways scientists describe evolution is they use the term descent with modification. Descent meaning, you know, one after the other after the other, um, and then modifications in the form of changes to traits, adaptations, those such things. Um, evolutionary change is based on the interactions between populations and their environment. Um, that is one of the key features of natural selection. Remember the natural part, nature, um, that an animal is going to adjust or adapt to fit in their natural environment in order to better to, in order to better survive. Um, <clears throat> evolution is defined as change over time in the genetic composition of a population. And when we say change over time, we mean a long time. Um, in general, we say it takes 50 generations of a species in order to see one um, evolutionary or genetic change. So that's a long time. Evolution takes a long, long period of time to occur. We're going to start with a little history, a little you know, timeline of where this natural selection idea and evolution occurred. Please remember Darwin did not come up with the idea of evolution itself. That was something that was out in the scientific community um, even before he began his work. Um, so we're going to start with Carolus Linnaeus, or Carol Linnaeus. Notice he's living in the 1700s, so that's a, a long time ago. 1700s is when the U.S. was founded. You know, people first started coming here. 1776, remember, is the, is the rev, uh, war for Revolutionary War. Um, Linnaeus is a Swedish botanist, and he is considered the father of taxonomy. So his big contribution was classifying and naming plants and animals. So I'm sure you've seen this picture with the domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, kind of going from more general to more specific. That was Linnaeus. He came up with that. Um, he came up with the idea that you can name a creature using its genus and species. So you see the name of the red fox here is Vulpus Vulpus. Um, how this contributed to evolution is you have all these other kind of bigger umbrellas that these animals fall into. So the kingdom animalia includes all animals. The kingdom chordata, that's for spinal cord. So that's all animals that have a spine. Um, that in itself is kind of giving um, evidence to descent with modification to common ancestry. So this is again showing you kind of the kingdom um, phylum idea of these umbrellas of animals that are related. So you can see the kingdom animalia up at the top here. It's the broadest term. So any animal. And then as you go down, you're going to get more and more specific until we get to the canis lupus, which is the wolf. But every time you see this kind of area here, these species are all related. So chordata, again, the spinal cord, mammalia is mammals, carnivora. All of these creatures um, are more and more related as you go down. You can see Canis, this is all the dogs, um, and which is going to give evidence to the fact that these were all descended from a common ancestor. Um, so the farther down you go, the more related the animal is, and the more recently they were um, coming from a common ancestor. Next, we're going to look at two people, Hutton and Lyle. They kind of go together. Again, we're kind of late, mid-late 1700s, early 1800s, so a long time ago. They are Scottish geologists. So they actually studied the earth and the earth's crust and movement. Um, they came up with the idea that geological change has occurred gradually over time. So if you remember the idea of Pangea and the idea of how mountains form by plates colliding, they kind of came up with the tectonic plate theory. Um, you know, that's how where earthquakes come from. So it was very early geology kind of plate movement on the earth's crust. And the leap there or the connection with evolution is if the earth itself if the shape of the earth has changed over time, why have the animals not? So that kind of, you know, lends itself to if the earth's crust changed, the animals probably change as well and probably change and evolve to fit that changing earth. So next we have Thomas Malthus. And again, he's kind of the same period as Hutton and Lyle, late 1700s, early 1800s. He was actually an English economist, so he really wasn't a scientist. Um, he studied overpopulation in England. And if you think about overpopulation in the 1800s, um, it's way worse now. But there was definitely a boom in population at that time. Um, he was looking at it from economy expective, perspective. So he was looking at supply and demand, prices, um, you know, death rates and birth rates. Um, and what he kind of came up with is if you have too many people living in a city, 
um, that's where you get disease hitting the city and, and kind of the population usually gets lessened. That's where we get the Black Plague and stuff like that. Also, he's looking at the food availability. And the more people you have in a city, the less food's available. So you're going to get some people dying off. Um, so his big, big thing with evolution was the idea of overpopulation and competition and not enough to go around. He was looking at it from a different lens, but those ideas of not enough and people competing for resources really kind of led into the idea of natural selection. Now we have John Baptiste Lamarck, um, again, kind of the same time period, late 1700s, uh, early 1800s. He was a French biologist, so he's the first actually bio person here. He came up with his own mechanism for evolution before Darwin. So again, not evolution itself, but how evolution happened. Um, he called his theory use and disuse. People refer to it as Lamarckian evolution. Um, he thought that organisms change their behavior based on the environment, which is true. Um, organisms are going to change the way be they behave based on his environment. Parts of his theory does hold up and actually did kind of get incorporated into natural selection, but there's large parts of Lamarckian evolution that got disproven. So there's kind of two big animals that go with Lamarckian evolution. One is going to be a crab. The other one is a giraffe. So according to Lamarck, um, giraffes started off with short necks and there was food kind of higher than they could reach. So as the giraffes live, they stretch their necks. Um, so basically like every day they did a little stretch and their necks got bigger and that allowed them to reach the higher leaves. Um, and every time they stretched again, their neck would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And until those giraffes got progressively longer necks. And then there we go. We have the giraffe with a long neck. So because they, the whole idea of use and disuse, because they were using their necks a lot, they were stretching them out and changing them, that's where the evolution of the giraffe's neck occurred. And again, the other example here is a crab. And you can see originally all the crab's legs he thought were the same. The crab used the front claw to defend itself. And kind of like lifting weights, that claw got bigger and bigger and bigger the more the crab used it. So very much like building muscle. And then eventually this crab ended up with the bigger front claws. Now the problem with both of these, the crab and the giraffe, um, the idea that you can modify your own features during your lifetime is true. We see it all the time with people, right? Lose weight, gain weight, um, build muscle, get a tattoo, get a piercing, get plastic surgery. You are able to adapt and change your own body. Um, the, the place where Lamarckian evolution falls apart is Lamarck thought that those changes could be passed on. So if you're looking at this crab, this crab worked its whole life to build up this big front claw. When this crab had babies, that baby would be born automatically with a bigger front claw. So the logic in that is, you know, if you got a tattoo and then you had a child, the child would have the tattoo, the same tattoo in the same spot. If you lost a finger in an accident and then you had a child, your child will be born without that finger. And that does not hold true. So that's kind of where Lamarckian falls apart is those traits aren't able to be passed on down to, to children. And then we have Darwin. So Darwin's kind of early to late 1800s. He actually lived a pretty long time. Um, Darwin, of course, is the father of evolution. That's kind of what he's called. Um, a little bit of confusing because he didn't come up with evolution. He came up with the idea of natural selection, which is a mechanism of evolution. He was English. He was a naturalist. He came from a rich family. Um, his father was wealthy, so his, his family was wealthy. Um, what that meant in the 1800s is he had a lot of education. He had tutors. He went to school. He could read. He could write. He had a leg up on a lot of the population with his education. Um, when it came, came time to him to kind of go to the next step in life, um, maybe be a judge or a lawyer or a doctor. He did not want to. He did not want to do any of those things. Um, so what he did in 1831 is he joined a ship, a, the HMS Beagle, um, for a five-year research vo voyage around the world. So this ship, the Beagle, um, was kind of doing research in terms of trade routes, um, of resources. They were trying to find, you know, could they get coffee from somewhere or spices or whatever it was. And uh, Darwin's role was to be what they called the naturalist, which means when they stopped, he went out on the ship and he looked at what we call the flora and the fauna. That's the, the leaves and the animals. Basically, he was just surveying them. He was kind of just saying, this is what's where. And then his, his job was to take that back to the government, to the king. And then the king would know, you know, oh, maybe we can go to this area and get, you know, get, get spices or salt or whatever it may be. <clears throat> 
Um, in a way, this was kind of like Darwin running away from his responsibilities. His family was not happy about this. Kind of like backpacking through Europe. You're, you're having a gap year. He kind of just jumped on this ship and went, and went sailing on an adventure. Um, it said that he hated it, that he got really, really, really seasick. Um, so it wasn't the best plan for him. And again, this journey was five years. They weren't always at sea. They did do ports, but it wasn't really great for him. Um, one of his biggest stops that the ship weight made was the Galapagos Islands. And we're going to talk about them a lot. He made a lot of kind of discoveries there. He was not intending or purposely researching natural selection on the ship. It kind of came to him with the more flora and fauna that he found. Um, he published his works, his kind of ideas in 1859. His book is called On the Origin of Species. You can still find it. It is still in print. It is written in kind of that old English, so it's a little bit hard to, to read, but it is there. Um, he did not uh, print or publish right away. You see the, the gap there. So he, in 1831, he goes on the voyage. He's back by 1836. Um, he had his kind of data and his idea, but he did not print until 1859. And the story goes that he did not print because he had a wife and his wife was extremely religious. And, you know, back then evolution kind of went against what the church was teaching. The church didn't like evolution. It is different now. Um, the Catholic Church or the, the Church of England that he belonged to does support evolution, but at the time it was taboo. Um, and his wife basically told him, please don't publish, and he didn't. Um, the story goes that he was working with another scientist. That scientist um, was called Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, Wallace had come up with the idea of natural selection on his own through his own research, and they were kind of sending letters back and forth about what they found. Um, and then he found out Wallace was going to publish. <laughs> so but Wallace was basically going to beat him and publish his findings. So uh, Darwin hurried up and published first. Um, and we know Darwin's name. We don't know Wallace's name. Um, Darwin was heavily influenced by the guys we just talked about, Lamar, Cutton, and Lyle, Malthus. He used a lot of their work and research in his own um, idea. Um, natural selection was not super well received at first obviously you know more went into it and now science that's our leading theory of how evolution occurs so here's darwin's theory wrapped up in four kind of points postulates whatever you want to say um so he says populations produce more offspring than can possibly survive that's kind of a malthus influence that's the idea of overpopulation individuals in a population vary extensively from each other mostly due to inheritance so there has to be variation there has to be some kind of struggle to survive or competition. So basically, individuals with better characteristics are better suited to the environment and will survive, and animals who are not will die. And there must be unequal ability to survive and reproduce, meaning only the best are going to survive, which is going to result in gradual change towards the better trait. So a classic example here is mice and a hawk. Um, you can see the environment that the mice live in is this kind of dark gray you know, maybe it's a volcano, mountain kind of thing. Um, when you start, the mice have to have a variation in their population. So you notice they're not all one color. There's some beige and some black. Um, when the hawk or the bird comes, you can see that they're eating the beige mice more often. So you see the three black mice here are still there and much of the beige mice are gone. One of the important factors there is the hawk is not eating the beige mice because it knows they taste better or prefers them. The only reason the, the hawk is taking the beige mice is because they can see it. Because the beige mice do not blend in better with their environment, you see the black ones blend in better, they're just better able to see the beige and that's the ones they pick. They're still eating the black ones just at a different rate. They're eating them less often than the beige ones. So what happens is you get a shift in the phenotypes, a shift in the trait, and at the end you're going to end up with a higher um, occurrence of black mice than of beige mice. Again, notice there's still beige mice. Those beige mice aren't going to disappear, but you get a shift in the population to the color black. It's important to remember that populations overall evolve, not individuals. Um, so a deer cannot realize, you know, if it snows, and turn itself white. That doesn't happen. It has to be a whole population of individuals over a long period of time changing. We use the term fitness or evolutionary fitness to determine how well an organism survives in its environment. So if an organism is very, very evolutionary fit, or we say it high, has high fitness, it's very well adapted to its environment. And low fitness will be the opposite. 
So in order to have natural selection, you must have differential success in reproduction, differential success in fitness, um, so that basically adaptations result in the population because only the strongest or the best or the ones with the best traits are going to survive that particular environment. So if we look at natural selection and compare it with artificial selection, artificial selection is how we do like racehorses or breed dogs. Um, in natural selection, nature is the deciding factor. The environment that the animal lives in is going to decide which traits are the best. So, you know, is it green grass or is it snow? Is it sandy or is it dirt? In artificial selection, man or humans are going to decide. So especially if you talk about with dog breeds. So... The, the traits that we select for in dog breeds aren't really necessarily best for the dog or the dog's survival. It's kind of what we want. So that's how you get, you know, some breeds of dogs with, with less than perfect health. Um, natural selection works on the individual. Artificial selection is selectively breeding for a, a population. One of the ba major downsides of artificial selection is you get inbreeding. And inbreeding is never good because inbreeding reduces what we call genetic variability. Um, so an example for natural selection would be beaks, uh, artificial selection would be Dalmatians or any kind of, you know, bred dog that we have created. Um, and again, artificial selection isn't always great, but that's kind of a way of showing you how you can take a trait and continually breed for it and create that a new brand new population. Um, so kind of artificial selection can take place over a shorter amount of time where natural selection takes a long amount of time. You know, humans have a great ability to do these things that may not always be great for the animal. When we talk about evolution, we often talk about population genetics or the genes found in the population. And that is because, you know, that's what's going to decide what traits show up. Um, Darwin didn't have a good grasp of genetics. So he could talk about the traits and the traits being passed on from parent to offspring, but he didn't really understand inheritance or genes or alleles or any of that. He used the term trait blending and some other kind of terms that kind of insinuated um, genetics. It wasn't until later that the actual genetic part came up, and that was Gregor Mendel, who we're actually going to talk about later. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of distinct genetic information with Darwin, but you know he had that general idea that that was what was occurring. We do know now that parents pass heritable units that we call genes to their offspring, and that is how that good trait or that help surviving trait or adaptation gets passed on from one generation to the other. So oftentimes we're going to talk about microevolution, micro meaning small, that leads to macroevolution or long, you know, overreaching large changes. Causes of microevolution include mutations, sexual recombination, natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. And we're going to talk about each one of these individually. So the first is a mutation. A mutation is any change in an organism's DNA. Mutations are random. Um, mutations occur kind of all the time. Some mutations are bad. Some are good. And some kind of don't do anything. So there are mutations happening in your cells all the time. Um, and your cells could just die and nothing comes of it. So a mutation is usually a good change that occurs that helps the population to survive. Mutations can be small, called point mutations, or large, which are gene duplications, or whole genes um, of changing. And they will alter or create new alleles in the population. So one example of that is um, albinism or being albino. Albino is total lack of pigment, so you'd be all white. That is a mutation. So that is a random occurrence that occurs um, in, a, in a species. If that is beneficial, that could be passed on to the offspring. Sexual recombination is what allows, you know, most animals to have variation of traits in their population. If you think about humans in general, there's very few of us that look exactly alike. And that is because we produce sexually, meaning we get half our traits from mom, half from dad. And then it kind of depends on how those traits shake out. Um, so any kind of sexual recombination, crossing over, mixing up of the genes, again, is going to lead to genetic variation, which is always good for evolutionary survival. And we've talked a lot about natural selection. That's a piece of the microevolution. So if we look at this picture, again, the birds are picking the green beetles because they don't blend in as well as the orange beetles. So that sandy beige environment is best for the, the beige orangey beetles. So natural selection takes over and that trait becomes more common. Genetic drift is any change in a population due to chance. So this is kind of 
an, another way that evolution occurs. This is not natural selection. So genetic drift is not that natural selection. It's kind of random things that happen. Um, two kind of examples or the two kind of ways that this happens are bottleneck effects or founder effects. So a bottleneck is any genetic drift due to a drastic, sudden, um, random reduction in population size. So I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second. This is like a natural disaster type thing. Um, certain alleles may be over or underrepresented by chance, not survival, not what's best for the environment, just total chance. And then founder effect is where you get a few individuals either becoming isolated or moving to a new place. And again, the individuals that move have nothing to do with any of their traits. It's totally random. And that can change, you know, the alleles in that population. So this picture is showing the bottleneck effects. You see the original population. Um, you have green, red, and orange circles. For the most part, the orange circles seem to be a little bit more dominant. And then you get the bottleneck effect. This is, again, a large decrease in a population due to a random event. So usually natural disaster. You get a flood, an earthquake, a meteor hitting the earth like the dinosaurs, where only a few of the organisms survive. The ones that survive, survive by chance. It has nothing to do with their you know, ability to adapt to an environment. And what can happen is, because you see here more reds happen to survive, now the population has shifted to have more red and way less orange. And the, the key feature here is it's totally random chance that that happened. And again, this is showing founder effects. So you get butterflies, orange, white, and brown. And just by chance, they move to this new area and only the brown and orange. So this new kind of butterfly population over here probably wouldn't have a lot of white butterflies. Again, nothing to do with the environment. That was just a random chance thing that happened. And the last thing would be gene flow. And this is due to migration, emigration, movement in and out of a population. So obviously, if you look at the picture here, when this brown beetle kind of just moves into the green beetle habitat, now you get a different um, gene combination, a different trait in there. And again, this is random. You see the example is a windstorm blows pollen to another field. This has nothing to do with natural selection. And this can change, gain, lose, change the allele population. So selection is the process of how these traits are going to be selected for during natural selection, kind of how natural selection works. There's three main types, which is directional, diversifying, and stabilizing. So this is kind of the way that it can happen. You see in the original population, you have this kind of very light colored mouse all the way to a darker brown mouse. And they're kind of a bell curve distribution where the, the highest or the most are this middle ground. And you have very few light, very few really dark. So what happens here is you get some kind of, uh, you know, environmental change. There's something happening in the environment where the mice have to adapt. And these are the three kind of ways that that can happen. So the first one is directional. You see how the whole chart kind of shifts. Um, so the light colored mouse are actually eliminated. The first two you can see are gone. And so you kind of got less traits here where you get the darker kind of edges of the mice. It's still the same shape. You still get more of the middle ground, um, but the whole like kind of light colored mouse disappears. Diversifying is where you get a big dip in the middle. So kind of the middle of the road mouse mice disappear. You get kind of just the two separate ones. You get a really light or really dark. This one diversifying is what mostly leads to two separate um, species forming because you see this kind of will go down and down and down until these two species will separate. And then stabilizing you see only the middle ground now is going to survive. You're losing the edges. Stabilizing is not great because... Um, it's going to reduce the genetic diversity. The example here is human height and birth weight, which kind of isn't going to um, do anything major to our survival. But if this is happening kind of with coat color here, that wouldn't be great for the animal and could lead to extinction. I will tell you AP loves these graphs. So these graphs are important to kind of recognize and be able to explain what's happening. So one of the key features of Darwinian fitness is that reproduction. So it's not only the ability to survive an environment, but to reproduce and pass on your, your genes. In Darwin's view, basically, if you're not you know passing on your genes to offspring, there's no point in your life. That's kind of his kind of explanation. Um, sometimes something called sexual selection can come in. Um, sexual selection is the idea that animals have a choice in who they're breeding with. 
And this is where we get like the, the very colorful birds here, um, the big antlers on the males, um, the big lion's mane. This is where the males usually show off to attract the females and the female will select to breed or mate with the best quote unquote male. Um, so that's kind of sexual selection. Sometimes the trait that is best sexually is not best survivability wise. Um, the ones you see here pretty much are both. Um, an example of that would be a peacock. So the brightly colored peacock is the male. Um, a female peacock is kind of brown and not really great looking. They don't even have that big tail. So anytime you see a peacock with that big tail, you know, looking fancy, that's the male. And he's doing that to attract the female. That huge tail and coloration isn't great for the male's survival. If you think about it, they can be caught with the tail. Um, it's very kind of noticeable, so they stick out in the environment. So that is kind of an example where sexual selection won over natural selection, um, where the brightly coloredness to get a mate was more important than the than the ability to kind of survive and sh and hide in an environment. Um, so sometimes that happens as well. So don't forget, evolution occurs among a population, not an individual. Populations themselves evolve over time, not an individual organism. So remember, a population is a group belonging to the same species living in the same area. And species are members of populations that can interbreed breed and produce viable offspring. Um, a gene pool is all the combination of genes that exist at any time, basically all the traits that are available. Um, and a fixed population is members that are homozygous for a trait, meaning there's very little variation, which isn't super common. Speciation is the process of creating a new species. This is how we get old, you know, new species from old. Usually what happens is you get a series of microevolutions um, indicating changes in a single gene pool that lead to what we call macroevolutions, which is large change over time. Um, one of the examples that Darwin talked about with speciation is going to be those Galapagos finches that we talked about at the beginning. So when he was in the Galapagos Islands, which are a series of islands that are connected um, kind of like Hawaii, so it's called an archipelago. So they're, they're different islands that have different environments, but they're very close together. He saw that on each island, there was a finch species that had a very different beak. And the big thing that he discovered was the beak went with what the bird ate. So what he got from that was there was an original ancestral finch, and when these other finches moved to the different islands, they evolved to have a beak that perfectly fit what they were eating. So these all around are new species of, of birds, the new species of finches. So the species came out based on those evolutionary changes based on what they were eating. There's also two patterns of evolutionary change. One is anagenesis, and you can see that's called straight line evolution. So you have the original species leading to a new one. The key feature there is the original one goes away. And then we have cladogenesis, where you have the original bird, which continues to survive, and then you have a new bird species that comes out as well as the original. So anagenesis is a lot of human evolution. Um, we kind of went from one species to the other. The original or the old one died out. And cladogenesis, again, birds would be a great example of that. So again, anagenesis is what we call phyletic evolution. You get gradual changes over time. It's a single direction, we straight line evolution, if you want to call it that. And the important feature is the original population goes away. They are not there. In cladogenesis, we say it's branching like a tree. Um, the original species does stay, um, and the gene pool is going to split. So you're going to have the original species plus new groups. And this actually increases the diversity of the species and is better for the organisms overall. So the idea of a species in evolution is really important. Um, in 1920, no, sorry, 1942, Ernst Mayer came up with kind of the definition of a species. And the key feature of a species, so if you are the same species, you can breed, essentially. You can have a offspring with a member of the, your same species. If you cannot, if you are not what we call reproductively compatible, you are a different species. Another term for that is reproductive isolation. These are barriers that prevent two species from producing ver viable fertile hybrids. So if you want to know, is an organism the same species as another, the question is, can they have babies? Can they have, you know, uh, healthy babies? If they can, they are the same species. If they can't, they are not. So there's two types of reproductive barriers. There's prezygotic and postzygotic. Remember, a zygote is that first one-cell organism when a, a male and a female mate. So when the sperm meets the egg, that initial you know, organism, that initial cell is the zygote. So prezygotic means before the zygote even forms. 
Postzygotic means after the zygote has formed. Most is prezygotic. Most times, species are prevented from um, from mating even before it happens. So they actually impede or stop fertilization or mating. So the types there are habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavioral, mechanical, and gametic. And then again, postzygotic is after the zygote forms. It prevents it from developing into what we call a viable adult. So this is where you get reduced, we call them hybrid viability and fertility and hybrid breakdown. So this is where you can get an organism born, but that organism itself cannot reproduce and therefore it's not a real species. So here's just a picture showing these barriers. So habitat isolation is kind of what it sounds like. If, if two organisms live in a different space and they never come into physical contact, they're never going to mate. Temporal isolation has to do with time. So this could be season. It could be season where they're mating or fertile. It could be time of day. So if you have, you know, a nocturnal animal, a night living animal, and a day living animal, they're never going to come in contact. Behavioral isolation has to do with their mating rituals, um, kind of how they flirt. Um, if that doesn't go or doesn't jive, they won't mate. Um, mechanical isolation is they physically cannot, so the pieces cannot go together. And gametic is their sperm and egg don't go. That has to do a lot with the alleles or the genes. So we have 46 chromosomes, and if you don't have 46 chromosomes, you can't match that up. So an organism that has 20 chromosomes versus 10 chromosomes, they'll never match up to form the gamete. And then postzygotic really, again, has to do with an animal is born, we call them hybrids, but they cannot make more of themselves. So this is where kids love, like, uh, this is where you get ligers and tigons, right? They exist. You can make a liger. Um, the problem is a liger and a liger cannot make a baby liger. They cannot um, breed with themselves, so they are not considered a species. Um, mules, donkeys, those are the same as well. And then we have a lot of plants that are like that, that are hybrids. Some other things we look at when we look at species, we look at morphological, which is the body shape, size, and structure. We look at the fossil record, which we call paleonto paleontological. Ecological, meaning their role or niche in a community. And then phylogenetic is their branch of the tree. What are they looking at? These are the four types of speciation. Um, AP really kind of sticks on sympatric and allopatric, but here's all four. Um, allopatric means there's some kind of geographical barrier that keeps the two species apart forever. So you see the blue and the yellow, they never interbreed. Sympatric is genetic polymorphism where you can see the red, the blue and the yellow make green. They kind of go together and they make a new species. Parapatric is where you have partial spatial isolation. So you have some blue species, some yellow, and then you have areas where they do overlap to make a new species. And then peripatric is where you get an isolation of a small part of the community. That's kind of like founder effect where you're going to get a new species out of that. Adaptive radiation is where you're going to get a lot of new species coming from a single ancestor. So it's this kind of shape of the circle with all the kind of like a wheel. Um, this occurs when a few organisms make it to a new distinct area. This is a type of allopatric speciation. Um, you're going to get environmental change, which can lead to extinction and new niches for new organisms. Um, so example here would be Hawaii. An example, again, of adaptive radiation would be Darwin's finches. So you've got a whole bunch of new finch species that came from the original one, depending on where they were living, what part of the islands they were living on. So again, this is showing you adaptive radiation in Darwin's finches, the Galapagos finches. And again, you had that original finch. All of these new species were formed because these birds went to live on a different island. And they evolved and adapted, mainly through beak size, based on what they were able to eat on each island. Sometimes um, two species, distinct species, can come together and kind of interbreed. Um, so when two splinter groups rejoin, you can either have kind of three outcomes of that. One is you still have one species. Two is you get two distinct species that stay separate, or one is you can get an interbreeding or hybrid zone. We see this depending on the animal, depending on the environment, depending on the change that occurred. So, for example, if we had, you know, if this happened because of a huge natural disaster where you have two different species and both of their um, numbers decline significantly, sometimes they do interbreed. Um, one example of this is this is where we think the Neanderthals went. So a Neanderthal was an early human subspecies. This was not a, a homo line species. It was a different one. They lived in Europe. Um, the Neanderthals did disappear, and there is some question of where did they go. There's a couple options. One is that the Homo sapiens um, 
beat them. So basically there was a war, we competed for resources, Homo sapiens won. The more common idea is we think Neanderthals interbred with humans. So they were a different species, but they were close enough to us that they were able to interbreed. Um, and they kind of, you know, went away in terms of they just kind of melted into um, the, the Homo species that was around at the time. 